Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. We have another, I think, really interesting case here that's quote unquote, a metabolic mess. So I'd ask you first, before we get into this, how would you define a metabolic mess, if you can? I literally have an image in my mind when I'm talking to patients about health, which is, and I've drawn this in one of my journals. So it's a foundation with three pillars that stand on it. And it's the way I think about chronic disease. So the three pillars are these three disease states that are responsible for the majority of chronic deaths, the atherosclerotic diseases, cancer, and the neurodegenerative diseases. And I think we have a pretty good understanding of what those are about. But it's this foundation that they sit upon that is so overlooked and yet so important, which is the sort of metabolic state of health that if anything other than fully optimized is going to increase risk for each and every one of those. So the obvious way to think about this is consider the most extreme state of metabolic dysregulation, which would be something like type 2 diabetes. So you think of this as a continuum, and at one end of the spectrum, you have unregulated type 2 diabetes, which by definition is a situation in which the patient is completely unable to partition fuel, even at the most basic level, which is to get glucose out of the circulation. In that situation, a person's risk of the pillar diseases goes up significantly. In fact, as we've discussed in the past, you would now argue that obesity and type 2 diabetes probably represent the second leading cause of cancer, second only to smoking. And of course, there's no disputing the relationship that type 2 diabetes has on Alzheimer's disease and on cardiovascular disease. So we absolutely know, as sure as God made little green apples, that if you want to further reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease, cancer, atherosclerosis, in addition to doing all of the quote-unquote disease-specific things, you must be the most metabolically flexible, metabolically healthy person imaginable. So to your question, what does that mean, Peter? Well, part of it is what we just talked about. Part of it is you better be able to dispose of glucose really, really efficiently. And that's why more and more and more of our patients wear CGM. It's why I still wear CGM five years later, in part because of it's an accountability tool, but in part because I'm always tweaking things in exercise and nutrition, things like that. And I always want to make sure I'm able to stick to that standard of, hey, average glucose is always going to be below 100. Standard deviation is always going to be below 15, which gives me a sense of how much it's cycling and therefore how low I'm keeping insulin levels. So what about other things? So one way that we typically can see if a person is kind of a metabolic mess is looking at their lipids. So sometimes a person will have very high LDL, very high triglycerides, and very low HDL. And in fact, the condition of metabolic syndrome is partially defined by two of those. So again, for everybody's remembrance, what is metabolic syndrome? So it's a syndrome that is meant to closely approximate insulin resistance And it's defined by having three, at least three of the following five things. Waist above a certain circumference, it differs for men and women, but basically truncal obesity, high blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, and high fasting blood sugar. So this is a really interesting patient because we'll go through his checklist. His HDL cholesterol is 54 milligrams per deciliter doesn't meet the criteria. The cutoff is 35. He's well above that. The triglyceride cutoff, I think, is 150. This patient is 69. So, I mean, the guy's in great shape. His waist does not meet the criteria. His blood pressure, I have to go back and look. He might have triggered it on blood pressure, but maybe not. And his fasting glucose was 94. And his hemoglobin A1C, by the way, 5.6. So this is a guy who goes to the doctor and gets the cleanest bill of health. Let me repeat this. You look at his lipid panel and it looks great. Total cholesterol, 166. LDL cholesterol, 199. HDL cholesterol, 54. Trigs, 69. I mean, who isn't jealous about this guy? You go a little bit further 
and you say, well, okay, let me see what his glucose was because everybody checks a glucose, right? And his glucose is 94. Hemoglobin A1C is 5.6. This guy doesn't have diabetes. I mean, this guy's a rock star. There is nothing that could go wrong with this guy. Let's send him out the door. But what if we dig a little deeper? So you look at his LFTs and his ALT, so LFTs are liver function tests. You look at his ALT, it's 32, and his AST is 32. Now, liver function test is a bit of a misnomer here. These are enzymes that are produced by the liver under the stress of the liver. So as the liver is experiencing any inflammation or scarring, these numbers will get higher and higher and higher. And we think of normal as generally below 20, but the lab says normal is below 40. We've had this discussion at length, Bob, I'm pretty sure. And I know, I think Rob Lustig actually discussed this on one of the episodes as well. So 32 and 32 is acceptable, but that's interesting. Okay, it's not perfect. The other thing that kind of would strike you as you dig a little deeper is his fibrinogen, which is an inflammatory marker, is 495, just a little bit outside of normal. And his highly sensitive C-reactive protein is 1.3. Again, most people wouldn't think anything of it. Most people think anything below 2 is fine. We kind of like to see it below 1. That's a bit odd. So we dig a little bit deeper and we see his homocysteine is 12, which again, the lab thinks is fine, but we don't think that that's fine. His uric acid is 7.8, which even the lab says, oh, that's getting borderline. But of course, the lab is only thinking about this through the lens of uric acid from the standpoint of gout. I'm already jumping up and down because I'm coming at this through the lens of Rick Johnson. So if anybody hasn't listened to the podcast with Rick Johnson, hit pause on this one. Make sure you go back and listen to that one if you really want to understand why uric acid matters. And I've been so influenced by Rick's thinking for the past four years that I've been fastidious in making sure that patients have uric acid below five, non-negotiable. In fact, if we can get a patient's uric acid level down into the twos and threes, I think it's operative. And we've seen incredible benefits on people's blood pressure and insulin resistance simply by reducing uric acid. So all of a sudden, this guy doesn't look like a rock star. So I want to be really clear. This guy is 0 for 5 on metabolic syndrome. He looks to be as insulin sensitive as they come. And yet his uric acid is 7.8. His homocysteine is 12. He's got signs of inflammation. And now let's get to the interesting part, which is when you look at his fasting insulin, it's 15. That's actually quite high. And then when we do the OGTT, at 90 minutes, his glucose goes up to 163 from 94, and his insulin goes to 170. And at one hour, his glucose is still elevated at 139, whilst his insulin continues to climb, now at 181. And by 90 minutes, he finally gets it under control with the glucose back to baseline at 92 and insulin while still dramatically elevated, at least down to 50. Again, you could almost say, Peter, this is just as much a reason to be doing OGTTs. And didn't you say you were done talking about OGTTs? And the answer is yes, I thought I was done talking about OGTTs, but I forgot about his OGTT until I looked at it here. But the point here is this is a guy who metabolically slips through the cracks. So the teaching point here is you can't, in my opinion, just look at the traditional markers of, does this person have met sin? Yes or no. You've got to dig a little bit deeper. 